Hello and welcome to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. I am very impressed with this podcast. We have Erica, Alice, and Zoe, and we're going to be discussing the transition to solar from three interrelated perspectives. And I was looking through the LinkedIn profiles of these three highly qualified people, and I noticed that they have connections to things like Harvard, MIT, Yale, the White House, Columbia, and my favorite, University of California, Berkeley, because I go to the University of California Berkeley family camp. I'm even wearing the wristband right now. It's my daughter's favorite thing to do, and it was my favorite thing to do. Maybe it still is. Anyway, and I'm just like a mile from Berkeley where I sit right now. I was looking at the different profiles of people, and I'll let people introduce themselves a little bit too, but they all have expertise in science and policy, and they are working at the Federation of American Scientists. And so we're gonna let them explain that because they understand it a little bit more than I do because they work there and most of them are in Washington, DC. And first of all, we have Erica Goldman, then we have Alice Wu, and then we have Zoe Bruins. How about Erica just introducing yourself and tell us about what you do and let's take it from there. And another thing too is this podcast, I like to make it educational. So that's what I do is solar education. And so a lot of times I'll probably stop the conversation and we'll define what somebody's talking about if somebody has some real fancy acronym or something like that. So let's take it to Erica. Hi, Sean. I'm really glad to be here today. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Erica Goldman. I currently serve as the Director of Science Policy Entrepreneurship at the Federation of American Scientists. Maybe I'll bookmark and come back to what do we mean by policy entrepreneurship in just a moment, but just a little bit about me and my background. I trained as a marine biologist, did my PhD studying actually jellyfish locomotion, have spent, done a lot of kind of interesting things in my career as a scientist, but including traveling to the Antarctic and the bottom of the ocean, but really, I think, found my true interest in the nexus of science and policy. I want to go to Antarctica. It's crazy. It's, it's on my bucket list, but <laughs> go ahead. But really have found my true passion in the boundary space between science and policy and have spent the majority of my career over the past 20 years in different roles in that boundary. So in the nonprofit space, also within Congress, brief stint in the White House. But now at the Federation of American Scientists, I think about our role in this space as being very, very policy adjacent and trying to bring individuals with great ideas into the policy space to affect change as kind of catalytic players from the outside. And our team does that in a lot of different ways, but it's a really cool niche to be in in this science policy space. And I'll stop there and pass back to you and to my colleague. Wow. Thank you so much. And next will be Alice Wu. Hi, Sean. It's great to be on the pod. I have a background in electrical engineering. I used to do research on solar cells. So I used to make very, very small ones in the lab trying to work on the next generation of solar cells. And then I think while I was in grad school, I talked to a bunch of people more in industry and realized that we have a lot of this technology and the issue is getting it out there in the world. And that got me interested in policy and led me to FAS, the Federation of American Scientists. Now I work on clean energy policy, climate policy, looking at how the Department of Energy can support all these different clean energy technologies in getting out there in the world, getting demonstration projects built, getting these technologies commercialized and off the ground. And I was just looking also at the page for FAS.org for you, and it said something about working on singlet fission solar cells. And I have no idea what that is. Singlet fission sounds like something nuclear to me. What are singlet fission solar cells? Yeah. So this was part of my graduate school research. I'm going to try to explain this in an accessible way. Basically, (laughs) maybe that's impossible. It's like (laughs) explaining relativity to a kindergartner. (laughs) Yeah. But the way that most solar panels work, they're made of silicon. And what happens is silicon has two energy, in general, two energy levels, one where the electrons are bound to their atoms and then one where they flow freely. And so when light hits the solar panel, an electron, if the light has more energy than the difference between these two energy levels, your electron gets shot up to the conduction band and then electricity flows. And that's how a solar panel generates electricity. 
The problem there is that no matter how much energy your light has, you can only get one electron to make that jump for every photon that hits the solar cell. And so there's a fundamental limit to the efficiency of silicon solar cells and other solar cells that operate like that. And currently, the solar industry has pretty much hit that fundamental limit called the shockley kweiser limit. And researchers have been trying to think about how do we overcome that fundamental efficiency limit and unlock more energy from the same solar panel. And so one idea is to stack a bunch of solar cells on top of each other. And those are called multi-junction solar cells. Um, or solar so that what, Yeah. But an alternate idea is that rather than doing that, since there's multi-junction solar cells have some challenges with matching current through the stack, that ends up making it a little harder in practice than in the lab. An alternate approach has been to use organic materials, which have slightly different properties from silicon. In organic materials, that would rather be than with carbon, right? Organic. Yeah. Carbon, so hydrogen. yeah, anything that is primarily carbon based, but can have usually has hydrogen, but can have like other atoms attached to it. If I was getting a suntan, would that be a organic solar process? I guess. <laughs> Don't worry. I use sunscreen. I'm... So go ahead. Sorry. Okay. For <laughs> no, no. So with organic materials, rather than having the electron jump straight into the conduction band, it forms something called an exciton, which is basically an electron and the hole that it left behind, and the two are stuck together. And these excitons can have, there are different types of excitons, and they can have different energies. And singlet fission refers to something called a singlet exciton splitting into two triplet excitons. And the singlet exciton has more energy than the two triplet excitons. If you had a material and you had some sort of high energy light hit it, it could generate a single exciton that could split into two triplet excitons. And then those two will then eventually create two electrons conducting through the material. The idea is to use that singlet fission process to get more electrons flowing out of a material. And the idea is to like layer this organic material on top of traditional silicon solar cells so that you can basically get some extra juice out of those high energy, out of that high energy light. Wow. So we need some of that triplet exciton juice. That sounds like some good stuff. So I want all the listeners to remember to use that in a sentence today, triplet exciton, and people will be really impressed and you won't even have to explain it. You'll just have to go like, you wouldn't understand. <laughs> That's new terminology to me. And I always think of fission is breaking apart an atom. And I know that has something to do with the birth of the Federation of American Scientists. But before we even talk about that, Oppenheimer and all those guys, I just thought I'd mention something. It's time for Zoe Bruins to give her introduction. Thanks so much, Sean. My name is Zoe Bruins. I'm a manager in clean energy at FAS. Unlike my two colleagues here, I am not a hard scientist. I'm a social scientist. My background is in comparative politics and policy. You don't, you don't and have any triplet exitons in your work? I learned about that Sorry just to today that. from Alice, yeah. and I think she's going to have to explain it to me a couple more times before uh -huh. I really get the hang of it. And my interest is really in institutions and governance and helping institutions right now domestically, but in theory all over the world, help them work better and help them serve their constituencies better. And that's a lot of what we do at FAS. So I've been at other organizations that do similar work. I've done research on how different countries manage things like climate resilience and conflict. But I'm excited to be here working with such smart people and helping, as we're going to hopefully speak about, helping implement some of the policies that make these solar technology advances possible. Yeah, I think that's a very important crossroads that you're taking care of is things like science and policy. One of the things that I see just from my perspective and working with codes and standards and installation and teaching people about this stuff and electric vehicles is that we need to be able to coordinate sending the electrons, not excitons, electrons, or electricity, we should say, back and forth into energy storage systems with virtual power plants where you can coordinate things. So if you have a battery or a car at home, you can export that to the grid when the grid needs it. And how do we make the policy to make that work? That's going to be super complicated. And fortunately, you are there near Capitol Hill, and I was there, I have a cousin 
that works for a senator and he took me underground all those tunnels there and it was pretty neat checking all that stuff out and that's the complicated place to make all of these people that have all these different motives work together to do what's best for all the people i'm just saying it's up to you and i'm really impressed this is the smartest group of people i've ever heard on any podcast ever i'm sure it is we're like einstein level here with the three of you thanks so much for joining us and let's ask a little bit too about the federation of american scientists so that's fas.org that's a nice short url that's really valuable and it looks to me like i was checking it out uh, the website and i know i've heard of it before too but i didn't know as much about it until i was just researching it, it looks like you're related to the DOE, you work with them a little bit, and it was founded by scientists that were worried about what was going to happen after they invented that thing at Los Alamos. And that's in the news or in the movies, at least, because that Oppenheimer movie came out. It's also interesting, too, as a personal thing, is my mom has some friends that have recently passed away, and they actually grew up, or they were kids over at Los Alamos. And so their parents were working there. And so it was a big, huge entire city that was top secret, all that kind of stuff. Who wants to tell me a little bit more about the Federation of American Scientists? I can start and then Alice and Zoe jump in on anything I might have missed. But Sean, as you flagged, our origin stories go quite a, a long ways back. So founded in the aftermath of the Manhattan Project by a group of entrepreneurial scientists really making it a priority out to hold government in account in terms of what was going on with the development of the atomic bomb. And I think in the 75 years since, FAS had, in its early days, really did focus in this nuclear transparency space. Over the past three or four years or so, we've dramatically expanded in scope, but not really changed kind of the spirit of our approach to issues in the world. So very much driven by this idea that good ideas can come from anywhere, but need help making it into the policy dialogue in ways that can be used and useful, led us to develop what we called the Day One Project, which basically was began in 2019, was launched in 2020. And the idea behind it was to source, initially was to source 100 actionable ideas for the beginning of a new administration, no matter what the political outcome. And in the spirit of that effort, we reached out far and wide across a whole host of different topic areas to basically get what we thought were the most promising actionable ideas that otherwise would not make it to policymakers' offices and in their ears. From there, that was the beginning of the expansion of how we think about policy entrepreneurship, though we still do have a pretty strong footprint in the nuclear transparency and nuclear information space. What we realized that this approach of policy development through entrepreneurship could span all sorts of different topic areas and that we had a unique edge in our ability to sense the demand. And so what I think unites us all as a team is that we're really good at being ears on the ground in the policy community and trying to understand when and where there's going to be an open policy window that science or technology can help bridge. And so that's led us to expand in areas like climate and the environment, in industrial policy. We're doing quite a bit of work in artificial intelligence, but it's all across all these threads motivated by the good ideas need to be in the mix in order to be turned into policy. And then along the way, in this sort of expansion journey, in 2021, FAS created the Talent Hub program. And so this is an expansion of the idea that not only can good ideas come from everywhere, but good people are needed to help execute those ideas. And what we realized quickly is that lots and lots of high leverage positions in government were suffering for what we call the but-for cause of impact, like the right talent in the right place in the right job to really help execute on a plan. And so that grew us to develop the Talent Hub program, which we actually worked to place fellows directly into government agencies. And from our inception in 2021 to now, we now have over 100 fellows in government spread across 22 different agencies. And what unites our fellowship program is what we call this sort of but for cause of impact, but for a talented scientist, technologist, or other expert in a role, progress in that domain would not be made. And so that's, I think, a lot of what unifies FAS's approach today. But it's still, I think, Hughes really close to our origin stories and where we came from. Allison, Zoe, what would you add? Erica, I think you covered it wonderfully. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree. I would just clarify that 
I know you mentioned that we're not necessarily affiliated with DOE, but as I think we'll talk about, our clean energy work obviously works very closely with DOE. And part of that is just because of the position that they and several other like key environmental and climate and energy focused agencies, the position that they're in right now as a result of some of the recent legislation. Great. Okay. So is the Federation of American Scientists, is it a like a 501c3 nonprofit? Okay. And you probably get grant money is how you operate, I guess, mostly. But if I had an extra million, I could just send it to you and get a tax deduction. I'll see what I got in my pocket right mm-hmm. now. You welcome that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. No Thanks. problem. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And so are the three of you primarily working with like solar and renewable energy? Is that Kind of your thing? Zoe and I work a lot on clean energy. Zoe from the talent side and then me more from the technology side. Great. Okay. And for the talent side, that's like workforce development and stuff like that. So is that like training? It's sometimes training. And I'll just add on to what Alice said as well is that I think like I mentioned, my own interest in institutional governance is a lot of what we do on our clean energy team, which is helping government. And just by virtue of how we've grown the program, the Department of Energy help them figure out more creative or innovative ways to achieve the mission that they're trying to achieve. They obviously came into a lot of additional funding a few years ago through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm so used to calling them Bill IRA. I need to think for a second what they actually stand for, uh, which is really exciting. But you then think about all of that goes into all these different offices. And a lot of them were overloaded immediately with how much money that was. Like passing the law is just the first step and all the implementation that comes afterwards, actually getting different awards out the door, helping spur those technologies like solar. So I think a lot of the funding is probably going to solar and to wind just because those are the companies that are out there that are scaled up, that are commercialized. That's the technology that is most readily available. Then those companies would come to DOE They would apply for some of the funding opportunities that were a part of Bill and Ira. And we think about ways to help accelerate, make those awards, those funding opportunities more accessible to companies or help DOE make really strategic investments using different regulatory authorities or different procurement authorities. And then the talent piece is you have all of this money, you have to get it out the door, you have new offices to set up. You need people to be looking at applications for permits and for these technology companies and for communities. And so obviously with all of that happening, you need people. And I think that's the core of what our talent theory of change is, is you can't get any of this stuff done. Like it can't be automated, right? So much of this stuff. I think we think a lot about how AI or how machine learning could be used as tools in the government. But right now, I don't think there's functions that we work with that could just be given to a computer at the drop of the hat. So you need real people who are, like Erica mentioned, these like technical experts, some of the best in their field. They want to make an impact. And we help connect them with those high leverage opportunities where they can both grow their skill sets and contribute to this once in a generation moment in clean energy. And like I said, I I think, although I don't work directly with solar, I think solar is, is a huge opportunity for DOE. And a lot of those funding opportunities have been going to solar companies. Yeah, great. Okay. Did anybody else want to pitch in on that? So Erica, are you working in solar primarily or other things too? I'm not. My portfolio is quite broad. So I oversee the whole of the science policy team, which includes climate and clean energy, but it also includes the bioeconomy. I do a lot of work in wildfire. So I've got a pretty Mm -hmm. broad mandate at the organization and I'm really work hard on identifying the where there are opportunities to incubate new programs and new ideas. One area that I think touches on solar that I did want to bring up is some work that Alice and I have done quite a bit on over the past year. And that's thinking about a positive tipping points framework for accelerating transformation. When we think about transformation in social technological systems like the energy transformation, I think there's a a paradigm that looks at how positive feedback loops and how change can become self-perpetuating. And there's been a growing movement in the climate space that's the anti-gloom and doom narrative around climate change. So we hear a lot about climate catastrophe and tipping points that take us past the point of no return. One um, kind of systems thinking framework that we've been really trying to pilot at FAS is one of how to accelerate positive tipping points for transformation. And that's where the energy system really comes in. And so thinking intentionally, Zoe brought up the major legislation that we've seen 
over the past year, that policy can be an enabling driver of some of these accelerants in transformation and energy systems. And I'd love for Alice to share a bit more, but we did a bit of a deep dive on the Inflation Reduction Act and looking specifically about how different interventions might accelerate the adoptions of technology like solar. And so that's my entry point in it too. I'm not a solar expert, but I definitely think big on the systems lens. And this is one area that I wanted to highlight. Great. Okay, Alice, it sounded like Erica wanted to hand it off to you. <laughs> yeah. I think the easiest way to maybe illustrate this in solar is to look at the like, ex I think there's been plenty of graphs of like the exponential growth in solar energy projects, funding, actual like energy capacity that's been built already. And that I think is the like exponential tendency for technology to spread like that is part of what Erica was saying about these, like there's these positive feedback loops that help propel technologies so that they grow much faster than we would initially expect. And I think there's been research done by academics that suggests that solar has potentially already passed what we call the positive tipping point, which is mm -hmm. the point at which there has been enough solar energy deployed that it's very likely to take over the market, in this case, the energy market. I think the Global Systems Institute is like a leading academic institute on this topic. And they put out a paper that suggests that like by 2027, solar will be the cheapest energy source in every country, except for the Nordic countries and the UK and wow. Ireland, because wind will be better there. That's pretty exciting. And solar is one of the first clean energy technologies to be, to, to reach this point. And it's really like leading the pack, I guess. And I think the one thing to note though, is that the positive tipping point, it doesn't say how fast this will happen. It says that once 10 to 20% of energy comes from solar, it's very likely that it will take over the market, but it might not do it in time to prevent one and a half degrees or two degrees C of warming. I guess something to note is that like making haste and trying to accelerate this still matters and policy is an important tool in making it happen. A local example is I'm based in California, the California Public Utilities Commission this past year just reduced basically the compensation rate for people who install rooftop solar on their houses. Yeah, and, we're crying about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and provide electricity to the grid. So they cut that by like 70 for 5%. So that's had a positive impact on getting people to install batteries at their homes. Solar battery attachment rates have doubled. And that's not ideal for the homeowner because their previous compensation source of compensation has changed, but it's good for the grid as a whole because the more energy storage we have, the more we can balance out these the peaks and dips from intermittent solar energy. Yeah, I think with something like that too, it's it would have been a lot nicer for the solar installation companies and the people if they made the change gradual instead of just all of a sudden one day, it's like it all happens today. And there's been a lot of companies that claim they've gone out of business and things like that because of that change to what they're calling NIM3 or net energy metering three. And do we even call it net metering because you don't really get that much when you're exporting, but it does make the batteries work. And now it's up to all of you, the, the smartest people in the world here to make this work. And I think what we need is like a really good policy to figure out how to take advantage of all these distributed resources, all these distributed batteries, and figure out how to take all these batteries and use them to support the grid. So it's up to you, lots of pressure. <laughs> Another thing we've been tracking on with respect to this is we're also gonna need a new workforce, a green technology workforce of the future. Things like the initiative that the administration just launched earlier this year, or I guess late last year, the American Climate Corps initiative to bring in new modeled off AmeriCorps, bringing in young people into the climate workforce. I think seeing that happen in a way that's robust and really tapping into the potential of young talent is something that I think will be fundamental to the success of the, the clean energy transition. Great, great. Yeah. So what did you call that again? The Climate Corps? The American Climate Corps is an initiative recently announced by President Biden to, it's modeled off AmeriCorps. Mm -hmm. It'll actually have some of the same infrastructure, but really targeting. And so you might have some of the stats off the top of your head in terms of the numbers of people that are being targeted to bring in for clean climate or clean energy and 
climate oriented jobs. But I think the vision is big and it was conceived sort of FDR in scale in terms of the conservation core in its vision. The idea is that we need a core of that magnitude to help with the clean energy transition. It's just in its early stages. The initiative was announced, I believe, late fall, and there's been a series of listening sessions that the White House has hosted in January, but all eyes on this effort to see if it can make its mark as a foundational way that we start to build the workforce that's going to be needed to basically do things like solar at scale. And I think there's a lot that's going to need to go into thinking about how to do this in terms of where does the talent come from? Does it require us rethinking what does university education look like? What are the roles of community colleges? What are the roles of vocational training programs? How do we increase access and equity in these jobs? I think it's a portal opening, not just to thinking about the actual adoption of the technology, but creating a new generation of workforce to help transform the space. Yeah, I'd be interested to learn how the American Climate Corps works, how people can sign up what jobs they're going to be having, and how that plays with unions and things like that, prevailing wage jobs, different states, how that's going to work, and when can people sign up? I think right now is getting in and ground zero, because I think the White House is still taking input at this stage to, it's like literally just being stood up as we speak. And so I think all of these details are being hashed out to get this program launched and get it right. And so we can definitely share some more information on that as well. Okay. Why don't you walk over to the White House right now and tell them what to do? We're trying our best, Sean, for real. We've got some fellows that are working with us. We run a program called the Policy Entrepreneurship Fellowship. And one of our fellows right now is specifically, her project is focused on how do we work with the American Climate Corps to diversify what we think of as green jobs. So not just in solar installation, but the high tech digital jobs that are going to be needed for the Climate Corps. We're very much on it in terms of trying to tell, trying to provide our best foot forward on what we think are actionable policy ideas for not just launching this bold new initiative, but doing it in a way that's robust and inclusive and really will meet the moment for the climate workforce. Yeah, and what it sounds like to me when you say the core, sounds like Marine Corps, things like that. And I've heard a lot of people say that we need to do something that's on the scale of what we do for wars. And so instead of spending all your money on a war, which is usually fighting over energy one way or another, even if you go back to Genghis Khan, their energy was pasture for horses <laughs> back in those days. And so we need to go for it just like they spent all this money on a war. And maybe it'll prevent a whole bunch of wars if we can figure out how to do this and make our homegrown renewable solar energy, which is hard to have a war over. It's not like we're going to go invade some country and put up a bunch of solar modules. I don't think, I hope not. And so Zoe, are you working with that or in studying that, the American Climate Corps? Yeah, definitely. Like Erica said, we're trying to help them I guess, problematize how this is being stood up. We're hoping to provide input. We've been to these listening sessions. We talked to people in the White House. And I think, like she mentioned, one of our policy and entrepreneurship fellows is specifically working on, okay, if we're going to do this and we're going to do this on a national scale, what are the jobs that will actually be needed? Back to your point about what would these people actually focus on? And we need to make sure that as the federal government looks at different categories of jobs, that those are up to date for what is actually needed, that these digital high tech green jobs are included. I think people think about commercializing a technology like solar and they might think about the people who manufacture the panels or who do the research to make better panels like Alice or the people who are putting them together on the ground or building solar farms or the people who are maintaining those. But I think it goes beyond just those core categories you're talking about the people who are, like I said, awarding funding, people who are contracting officers in the federal government. We need those people as well. There's a huge backlog of, of permitting applications in this country across not just in DOE, but in the Bureau of Land Management and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and beyond. We need people to help dig into those permits who have a really deep knowledge of the overlapping web of regulations in this country. We need people talking to communities to help prevent the issues that create permit backlogs in the first place, understanding what different communities need. Erica just mentioned, talked about making sure that this is done in a just and, and equitable way. And so you really need people coming from all areas of expertise heading into this thing. And I'll tell you, as someone who 
attended one of these listening sessions and helped provide feedback, there's a huge amount of interest in this. It was just back-to-back -back comments for about two hours of folks who were really passionate about this program turning out well, but also just passionate about the opportunity to serve. So I think you're saying like making this a national effort, the will is there. People are really excited to not only help solve these problems, these really sticky problems, but the opportunity to serve their country. And I think that's what federal government provides in terms of jobs that maybe they can't get in other places. You really have this mission that you're working towards. And I think aligning the administration's priorities with that massive, like, we're going to fight climate change and, and make the world safer and better for folks is a really winning argument. I could see that maybe one of the problems that you might have or some conflicts that could happen is if you have people that are working for something, I know you said AmeriCorps and I've had people that were in my classes that were grid alternatives, AmeriCorps people. And I don't think they pay them very much. It's going into the military where you don't get paid a lot, but it's something to do after high school and you're young and you want to have experience and save the world and all that kind of stuff. And that's interesting, saving the world by going out there and being in the military. And then the opposite is saving the world by, not really the opposite, but doing solar. And so if all of a sudden there's a lot of people that are not getting paid much doing solar, that might conflict with some people that are charging a lot of money that are doing solar. And I could see that could be a problem. I don't know what the solution is. I'm sure that you do have a solution for that. <laughs> and it's too like mobilizing the country. We need to get on the same page. Everybody needs to stop being selfish and we need to save the planet, all that kind of stuff. One thing too, that just that I've noticed that's interesting is there are a lot of people in the solar industry that I run into that don't think climate change is a thing. <laughs> and there's a lot of those people that are doing a lot more to prevent climate change than probably most of the people in the world that are saying that climate change is a terrible thing and all that kind of stuff. So it is just interesting. Sometimes I trick them into saving the planet. <laughs> I mean, I don't have to speak for my team when I say that we're nonpartisan and nonprofit. Yeah. And part of that means meeting people where they're at. And uh -huh, I think sure. a big part of supporting, especially DOE, from my perspective, at least supporting DOE and getting this money out the door is getting that buy-in from those private businesses. I'm assuming that if there's not a belief in climate change, then there's an interest in this new burgeoning economic opportunity. And I think that those should go hand in hand, that like this should be an opportunity that works for everybody. And if solar is the most scalable and the most advanced, then it's going to make them money. It's going to help with climate mitigation. I think we really think a lot about where the common ground is with folks and getting that buy-in from private businesses, despite what they might believe, I think is a really important part of this process. Yeah, and we can always use that cell phone analogy too, where it's like, I think we had one big telephone company and we had these really expensive long distance fees and it gets broken up. And now I don't have a landline. <laughs> and so we can do that with energy and we can see that things are very globalized and centralized, and then we can just put it on our roof. And one of the ways that I like to explain to people too, that we can do this because some people just say, oh, you can't do it with just solar or solar and wind, things like that. You got people in the nineties when solar costs 10 times as much as it costs right now. And they put solar on their roof and they have some batteries and things like that. And so if they can figure it out now that everything is 10 or 20 or 30 times less expensive, we can figure it out. And the hard part is getting to coordinate all that stuff. And just from what I see it from my perspective, the virtual power plant is and figuring out how to make that work with policy is super important. In fact, actually the way that I first got involved with solar is a good friend of mine, his name is Paul Finn and he wrote a law. He was actually a philosopher and I met him at Jerry Brown's house who was the governor of California, but this is when he, between his different reigns as being governor. And anyway, he wrote this law and it got passed first in Massachusetts and it's called Community Choice Aggregation. You might've heard of it, CCA. And I got to see the policy perspective and he was, I think PG&E was spending many millions of dollars trying to undo his law and he won and he got in the paper for all this David and Goliath stuff. It's interesting to see how things can happen 
with just like one person coming up with an idea, writing a law. And so I have one, an idea, <laughs> maybe you can make it happen. It's right now, if I put an extension cord over the fence to my neighbor, it's like I'm violating the utility monopoly or something like that. And if we could connect to our neighbors and make little microgrids and things like that, that would be really cool. And then we could have sort of an alternative to that net metering problem that you have in California when you export. So there's going to be some people on the block that are home, some people that aren't home, and you don't have to join it. And maybe what you do is you just, there could be some rule where it just says, this is how deep 18 inches this pipe has to be that's got wires in it. And you go to your neighbor's house, and this is how you meter it. And I see that a lot of these jobs are going to be programming that are coming up, right, regardless of my idea with that. And it's just trying to figure out how to compensate people, how to get it so the politicians and the utilities and the public utility commission, and of course, most importantly, the consumers, how they can coordinate all this stuff. And so I think that the three of you are smart enough to make this happen. So I want to thank you in advance. <laughs> Maybe you have some ideas about that, or can this work, or what do you think? Sean, I would put it back to you, because I think you just encapsulated our theory of change, which is that good ideas can come from anywhere, and you, it sounds like you have one, so we would, would like to invite you to consider writing it down as a policy memo for us, because I think, you know, our from where we sit, this is step one in terms of making change, is getting good ideas written down in a form that policymakers can access. And then where we come in, and I think where our expertise come in is helping to shepherd the idea from its initial stages into something more polished and then helping build the networks of like, okay, who needs to see that idea to turn it into reality? So I think you just helped us prove our, prove our point, what it would take to get that idea into policy. But yeah, we'd love to invite further discussion okay. on it. All right. Policy memo coming up. So how many words does it need to be? <laughs> we can send you a whole handbook on how to write a day one policy memo. And then I suspect that Alice and Zoe both would love to help shepherd that memo from incubation all the way to fruition. Yeah. Invitations out there, Katie. Great. We'll awesome. And so maybe also in the show notes too, we can put some different links to stuff For sure. like that. Yeah, is that just like something I could go find on the internet? A policy you send memo? it. We'll we'll share some resources with you. Okay. But great. But I, I think your idea is exactly where we start with experts all over places. Like, hey, what do you think about running like running a, a wire into my neighbor's fence? That's step one of even trying to like peel back the layers of what policies would need to be interrogated to think about how that might happen. Yeah. And then I see the biggest problem that you would have with that is the utility would say, no, I want you to go through me and go through the meter. And maybe it would be great to virtually go through the meter. That would even be the best way of doing it. But then you would need to figure out how to make it happen. And a lot of times with things like this, they make it so complicated that nobody does it. <laughs> yeah. And so part of the challenge here would be like identifying what are the barriers that are currently making it complicated. And what, then the flip side is what are the levers to start to change it. And it may not be mm -hmm. like, not every, you can't change everything all at once, but what we as a team are really good at is trying to figure out the ones that you can start to poke strategically on to get things to move. Yeah. And then some people might say that it has to do with politics and who appoints people to public utilities commissions and where the money comes from to get people elected. And maybe I shouldn't talk too much or I'll get in trouble. <laughs> but there's a lot of issues out there and it's just Difficult, I think, to make things change as fast as we need them to change. I think that I've seen pictures of they show New York and they show one year and then they show five years later and one day it's all horses and the next five years later it's all cars. And that's the change that we're seeing with the renewable energy industry. You look at like, I think it was now it's two years ago, approximately one and a half, two years ago, that the whole world hit a terawatt of solar and probably in another year or two, we're going to hit two terawatts. And then we're going to, 2030, they say it'll be a terawatt a year. And we're just having such incredible growth. It's really awesome and amazing. But then when we get all this renewable energy on the power lines, we need to figure out how to coordinate things. It's not like with benefits of fossil fuels is, yeah, it's stored energy from plants from millions of years ago. And we can turn it on and off when we want, like burning things. And now it's more intermittent. It's like when the sun's out, when the wind's out. So we need the energy storage and all that. We're figuring it out. We have the technology. 
prices are going down like crazy and we can implement it really fast. And it's just an amazing time to see all this happen. And I think that some people just can't visualize exponential growth. Our brains are more linear. And so it's good to just keep telling people how this logarithmic growth goes, exponential growth, how that works and how things can just change all at once. I was telling somebody yesterday how it's, you see throughout history is like for 10,000 years or something, everybody was riding a horse. And then all of a sudden we're all driving cars. Did any of you take a horse to work? I say, like, probably not. See, not that, today. that confirms what I was saying, but we could say that horses are renewable energy though, too. So, so I think that virtual power plants are pretty important and just like coordinating all that, how that's going to work. Are you working with the virtual power plants? We don't work with virtual power plants, but I will make a plug for the Department of Energy's Pathways to Commercialization liftoff reports. They've been doing a number of them over the past couple of years, and they really take an in-depth approach to each of these technology areas that are in varying stages of commercialization. Some of them are earlier on than others. But I'll send over the one on virtual power plants because I'm honestly, like I said, I'm not a scientist. Some of this newer technology I got to read up on first. We do work with DOE, I mentioned earlier, to think about creative procurement approaches. And that fits really nicely in with what these pathways to commercialization reports are all about. It's really taking a roadmap. Of, okay, in industry, in government, in states, in localities, what needs to happen in order to fully scale and make these technologies like solar, to bring them to the level that solar and wind are at, for example. And Alice has been working on a series of memos that lay out use cases and examples of how different authorities can be used to accelerate some of those technologies. So I think we work alongside them to make sure that they are using every single tool at their disposal in order to get these things like virtual power plants off the ground. They might not be widespread right now, but there's a pathway forward for them. And Alice, I don't know if you have anything to add to that as well. Yeah, I guess I would add, like, I think the other area to look at with how, with, like, the increasing prevalence of solar is grid transmission. California has to curtail its solar energy in the spring every year. So basically, like, cover up a bunch of solar panels, disconnect them from the grid, because there's too much energy being produced. And we don't have transmission lines to take them elsewhere for that energy to be redirected. Um, so I think getting more of the grid built out so that like when California has tons of solar energy, we can transmit that to other states. And rather than wasting that energy or having to turn off these solar panels, I think that's another important area that the DOE is looking at right now. I think they're working on a, another liftoff, pathways to commercial liftoff report on grid transmission and modernizing the grid. Yeah. And so that's something that I've heard too. And it was a stat that I heard from a couple of years ago, so I just know that it's maybe on the magnitude of a billion dollars a year of curtailed solar energy in California, and that's just because it's sunny and we don't have any place to send it, and they have to take the inverters and turn them down a little bit, not export as much. Some of the things that they're trying to work on would be like long-term hydrogen energy storage because you could take hydrogen and store it for long periods of time, so that's kind of a neat way of dealing with it. And of course, energy storage systems. And the last couple of years, we've built the biggest energy storage system in the world by far over in Moss Landing, which is not too far from where I am. It's like Monterey Bay. You might've heard of that place that we're working on and a lot to be done. And yeah, like you were talking about increasing the, the transmission and all that. So let's do it. Let's get it going. So this has been a really great conversation. I hope that we can do this again sometime. And talking to this Federation of American Scientists, these great scientists and policymakers that are really helping to transition the world to renewables, make the world a better place, get rid of the reasons to even have a war, because you can't really fight over sunshine coming down on top of your neighborhood or at least your state or wherever you're located. So it's a really great thing. Another thing that I noticed about the Federation of American Scientists, or is it something that just scientists can sign up for? I noticed like some statistic at some year, there were so many thousands of people is like Neil deGrasse Tyson. Is he a member? Did you sign him up or, <laughs> or is it not one of those things? Infrastructure is a membership organization yeah. where our mandate is we work with a lot of different communities within science and technology and have a pretty broad mandate. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks 
Erica Goldman, Alice Wu, and Zoe Bruins for being on this podcast. And thanks everyone for listening to Sean White's Solar and Energy Storage Podcast. To find out more about solar energy storage and all kinds of cool stuff, go to solar, S-E-A-N, that's solarshawn.com. And also I was gonna mention too, that there is the American Solar Energy Society Conference that is coming up and it's in Washington, D.C., where most of the people on this podcast are currently located. And it is from May 20th to 23rd. I'm doing a presentation there. My presentation is on May 22nd. So maybe we can all meet up there and hang out. That's going to be at George Washington University. And I believe my friend that wrote the CCA law is also going to be there. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And I'll be sure to check people out over there in Washington, D.C. Thanks for making it happen, everyone.